All right, so we looked at renal failure. Let's look at some of the consequences of renal failure now. Now, there's two forms of renal failure, acute and chronic, and both of them lead to an inability to make urine and excrete wastes, but they occur over different time periods. So the consequences of renal failure can be remembered with the acronym MAD hunger. First is metabolic acidosis, and that's due to the inability to excrete hydrogen ions. Patients with renal failure also have dyslipidemia, and it's not completely understood why triglyceride levels increase in these patients, but they do, and that's a good thing to remember, increased triglyceride levels. Patients also have hyperkalemia due to the inability to excrete potassium ions. And as BUN and creatinine fail to be excreted, patients develop uremia, which is a syndrome marked by nausea, anorexia, encephalopathy, asterixis and platelet dysfunction. Due to the inability to excrete filtrate, sodium and water is also retained and this leads to things like congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema, and hypertension. And because the kidney is involved in vitamin D hydroxylation, what do you think this will do to development in children with renal failure? it can lead to growth retardation. The kidney is also responsible for producing erythropoietin, so patients with renal failure can have anemia. And lastly, patients can also have renal osteodystrophy, which we'll talk about next. So renal osteodystrophy results from failure of the kidneys to hydroxylate vitamin D. Now, do you remember at which position of the vitamin D molecule is the kidney going to hydroxylate it at? It's 1-alpha hydroxylase. So it's going to hydroxylate it at the 1 position, and it's going to convert 25-OH vitamin D to 1-25. So 25-OH to 125 OH vitamin D and without active vitamin D in patients with renal failure patients have hypocalcemia and hyperphosphatemia as well as secondary hyperparathyroidism and the hyperparathyroidism leads to subperiosteal bone thinning because parathyroid hormone activates osteoclasts and those osteoclasts begin to resorb the bone and try to increase serum calcium concentration. So if you look in this patient's wrists we can see the fraying and thinning of the radial and ulnar metaphyses due to bone reabsorption. Now the hyperphosphatemia leads to tissue calcification and why is that? Because it's going to cause calcium to precipitate as calcium phosphate in soft tissues. So remember that this tissue calcification is occurring in soft tissues. The final topic in renal pathology for us to discuss is renal cysts, where instead of a normal kidney with a cortex and a medulla, a cystic kidney can be obliterated by fluid-filled cysts. And the first cause of renal cysts is autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, which causes massive, massively enlarged kidneys that ultimately destroy the kidney parenchyma. And you can see here in this CT scan just how many cysts there are in this kidney and how gigantic uh, 
these kidneys are. So patients that are usually adults present with flank pain, hematuria, hypertension, urinary infection, and progressive renal failure. Death is usually caused by hypertension, usually caused by hypertension or complications of chronic kidney disease or complications of CKD. Now what exactly is causing the hypertension? The hypertension results from increased renin production and this leads to aneurysms and mitral valve prolapse and the aneurysms can rupture and lead to hemorrhage in the brain and this causes death in these patients. Now 85% of cases result from a mutation in PKD1 which codes for a protein called polycystin 1. This is an integral membrane protein involved in cell-to-cell -cell as well as cell-to-matrix interactions of the renal tubules. Therefore you can imagine that a mutation in this protein may cause cells to proliferate in a disorganized fashion and form renal cysts rather than renal tubules. So rather than a tubule lined with cells, these cells begin to grow in a disorganized fashion and start forming these spherical cysts rather than tubules. And 15% of the cases are caused by PKD2 which codes for a protein called TRPP2. And the pathophysiology here is similar because TRPP2 and polycystin 1 are part of the same pathway. In the autosomal recessive form, patients are usually fetuses or newborns. And so patients can have renal failure in utero, which can lead to what problem in utero? Potter sequence. Concerns after birth include hypertension, portal hypertension, and progressive renal insufficiency. It's also associated with hepatic fibrosis. And the mutated protein is fibrocystin. And it's involved in tubulogenesis and epithelium architecture. So mutating it can lead to disorganized cyst formation and it's coded by the gene PKHD1. The last disease we'll look at is medullary cystic disease, which is an inherited disease causing tubulo interstitial fibrosis. It also leads to progressive renal insufficiency in patients, and they develop cysts in the medulla of the kidney. That's why it's called medullary cystic disease. And they lose the ability to concentrate urine lose ability to concentrate urine. And why is that? Remember the structure of the nephron, it dips down into the medulla. So here's the medulla and here's the cortex. The descending limb and the loop of Henle and the thick, the descending limb and the ascending limb of the loop of Henle we're able to concentrate the urine with our counter current exchange multiplier. And so when we have cysts in the kidney and we lose the architecture of the kidney, we lose the ability to concentrate urine. And the medullary cysts are usually not visualized, but the kidneys will appear shrunken on ultrasound. And prognosis is usually poor in these patients, unfortunately. Now let's finish this exciting chapter of renal pathology by looking at the difference between simple and complex renal cysts. Simple cysts are usually found in the outer cortex and they're usually filled with ultrafiltrate. They are very common and account for the majority of all renal masses. So these are more common.
They're usually found incidentally and are typically asymptomatic. So asymptomatic, more common, outer cortex, usually filled with ultrafiltrate. Complex cysts, on the other hand, are septated, like you see here. They have walls that divide them into smaller parts. They enhance with contrast on CT. Enhance with contrast because they have some vascularization. And they have solid components. Solid components. These are going to require follow-up or removal due to the risk of what? Malignancy, such as renal cell carcinoma. So these can be malignant. Okay, flash quiz. What is usually the cause of death associated with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease? The answer is Death is most commonly due to complications of chronic kidney disease or hypertension. And what is this hypertension caused by? Increased renin production. Patients have progressive renal failure, which can lead to complications and death. And remember, the hypertension, which is caused by increased renin, is activating the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system leading to hypertension and complications such as berry aneurysms, which can rupture and lead to hemorrhage in the brain and death. Okay, let's check ourselves now with a USMLE style question. A 36-year-old man presents for an annual flu shot. He has been treated for hypertension with an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor since age 30. He denies smoking and alcohol use. Family history is notable for his father requiring dialysis at age 50. An older brother recently underwent unilateral nephrectomy to decompress intra-abdominal organs. On examination, the patient appears barrel-chested and has a sitting blood pressure of 135 over 90 millimeters mercury. The likely genetic renal pathology is associated with an increased incidence of which of the following? The correct answer here is A. Now let's see why that's the case. First we have to figure out what is the likely genetic renal pathology. And the answer is autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. The patient's father required dialysis at a relatively early age. And the patient's brother had an operation for an enlarged kidney that was compressing intra-abdominal organs. And the patient has hypertension. And all of these are consistent with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, which is associated with berry aneurysms, especially in the circle of Willis. So the correct answer is A. Now let's look at why the other answer choices were not correct. B is not correct because horseshoe kidney would not describe the extra renal findings presented in the patient. C is not correct because cherry red spots in the macula are associated with Neiman Pick disease, which is a lysosomal storage disease. And D is not correct because Potter syndrome involves renal agenesis, and the patient would not be able to make it to adulthood. And finally, E is not correct because Potts disease is a tuberculosis infection of the vertebra. So, this is the end of the renal pathology section. I'll see you next in renal pharmacology.